Um, speaking of, of working with The Undertaker, how was it being the best duo, uh, the Brothers of Destruction, and basically taking over the WWE? Yeah, it was awesome. I don't know if we were the best duo because there's been a lot of great tag teams, and I'm a huge fan of the Road Warriors. Um, you know, you also have um, um, the Rockers and, you know, all these, all these different tremendous tag teams, the powers of, um, you know, uh, powers of pain, the mega powers, all this stuff. It was, uh, it was really cool. The one thing that we always had an issue with, though, is who can actually take Undertaker and Kane? You know, they're both such powerful characters um, that we had to figure out ways that we could be beaten or at least become vulnerable. Uh, so there were challenges. On the one hand, it was really awesome. It was really cool. But... You know, in the wrestling business, you always, okay, if you win a championship, you also have to think, how am I going to lose that in a way that benefits everybody? And it was really hard with, with Mark and me because we're both, again, we're just so big and the characters are so dominant and well-defined that, you know, we had to figure out ways. And generally that involved Kane getting hurt and incapacitated. Um, but we had to figure out ways that we could become vulnerable so we could actually get down to the level of our opponents. I have a quick question for you. How do you feel about the modern day culture of wrestling versus your era that you experienced? It's certainly different. I was at a WWE Super Show back home a few weekends ago and I saw AJ Styles and Ginger Mahal and that was in Cody and that was like the only people I really knew, right? And, uh, and then the production people, but I, you always realize that, oh, wow, everything's changed. And even from when I started to the end of my career, uh, things had changed quite a bit. You know, I came in kind of the tail end of the rock and roll lifestyle and all that. Um, and many of the changes were very positive. You know, you talk about becoming more of a corporate atmosphere and how horrible it is. It's not. I mean, you know, the, WWE does have a vested interest in the health and welfare of the people that work for them. So a lot of it was very good. You don't have the stories that you had from back in the day, um, but a lot of it was very good. But yeah, it was different because you know, the, the, the performers now are, um, are much more interested in what people are saying on, online and all that stuff. And when I first started, there wasn't obviously a Twitter or Facebook. Um, so as far as a purist, uh, to see those changes, it kind of bothers me, you know, because uh, it, it's the whole the whole thing is it's a magic deck, and when it's done well, you bring people into this fantasy world, but they're convinced that they're in it for however long, right? Well, if if literally you have people saying, "There's the wires. This is how the trick is done. This is how the trick ends up," well, that becomes much harder. But it's also a change that you can't control. So, you know, you have try to take advantage of that as much as you can. Um, so there are positives and negatives to that. Overall, I think things have, have really moved in a positive direction, uh, but it is different. There are things that I do miss about back in the day. What's up, Kane? Hey. Favorite in the ring punching bag between Mankind or, Gold, or Goldberg, or sorry, Goldust? Do what? Who was your favorite person to beat up in the ring, Mankind or Goldust? Oh, gosh. I, I don't know. Does it just have to be those two? <laughs> no. Oh. It, it just seems like you always whoop their ass the best. <laughs> well, the, I was on the other end of that sometimes, too. Uh, it's probably Mick. Dustin is a very dear friend of mine. Uh, but... Mick, could, you could just do any, I mean, he would literally volunteer for things, you know, hey, uh, the first time we ever had a match, we actually had a match, my first match with him was in Puerto Rico, right, before I ever got into WWF at the time, but we had the match at Survivor Series, again, uh, we were overshadowed because that was also happening in Montreal, screw job, but nevertheless, Mick and I had our first pay-per-view match that night, and, uh, you know, he wants to do this deal where he climbs up to the, uh, the top rope, and normally, you know, instead of throwing him off in the ring, he wants me to throw him from the top rope to the floor. And that's nine feet, right? And I'm like, you're crazy. And no, I want to do this. Okay. Uh, so he would, he would actually volunteer himself to be not so much a punching bag as a crash test dummy. 
So that was always good because it made me look good. Uh, but nevertheless, and then like I said, Dustin's a, a very dear friend of mine. Um, but I don't think I beat him up nearly as much as I did Mick, actually. So. All right, and we have time for one more after okay. this one. So uh, there you go. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Good, bud. During the story arc of Imposter Kane, was there someone they had in mind for that, or did they have multiple imposter canes that you kind of tested with? No, yeah, that was always, that was always Luke Gallows. Um, was who that was beforehand, yeah. And um, that was, a, it was a great idea. <laughs> then the execution, not on our part, wasn't great. What had happened was I had gone down and saw him and everything. He was down, uh, that was when uh, NXT and the training center, all that stuff was in right outside of Atlanta. So I went down and I was like, oh. the outfit looks great, he looks great, but that wig is terrible. Like they had a synthetic uh, wig instead of the actual human hair. Human hair, don't ask me how I know this, but human hair wig looks a little, just looks a lot better. It actually, it looks like hair and you can take care of it. The synthetic stuff is just all over the place. Well, and I told them that, right? Well, apparently no one actually listened to me because when he walks out for the first time, <laughs> He's wearing that wig and his hair's like, ping, right? And Vince lost his mind because it, it, it just looked fake, you know? And so Vince lost his mind, and that was pretty much the end of the whole thing. Uh, but it was a cool concept, right? Because, again, it's just all kind of things that are happening inside Kane's mind are playing out in the real world. Uh, and then Luke went on and, and was able to uh, have a successful run of his own doing some different things. But... Yeah, when he was standing at the top of the ramp, I was like, yeah, they didn't fix the wig, and Vince is going to hate Because Vince hadn't seen it yet. And so the first thing he saw, and, and Vince was very much like his first impression, that was it. And if it wasn't a good first impression, it was done. And when he saw that, it was done. And that's why we only had, like, the one pay-per-view match, and then I think I beat him up the, the next night and threw him out of the arena, and we have never talked about it again. Until you just brought it up. <laughs> okay, one more, right? I hope no one else has stole my glory, but I remember watching you back in the Smoky Mountain days. Can you clean up a good Jim Cornette going <laughs> off story? Yeah. So when I first went to Smoky Mountain Wrestling, which is based in Morristown, Tennessee, and I was really excited. I'd been in Puerto Rico. Dutch Mantel uh, had worked with Jim a lot and uh, had gotten me the job there. So I'm really excited. Uh, I come in, and, you know, we, we came, we actually came here, but we went all over North Carolina, East Tennessee, West Virginia. So um, my original tag team partner was Eddie Gilbert. Then we filmed, like, four weeks of TV at our first TV taping. Then Eddie got the job as the booker in Puerto Rico and went back to Puerto Rico. Um, so they brought in Al Snow as my new tag team partner. And Al, Al's a great guy, man. You know, we, we just... You know, just really cool dude. Um, the first, I can't remember where we were. It might, it might have been like Lenore, North Carolina, um, or it might have been Hickory, actually. So we were over in North Carolina, and Al had driven down from Lima, Ohio, which is like a 10-hour drive or whatever. So he gets in to do the TV, and he's having a match with George South. You guys know George South? Yeah. George, yeah. And George, great wrestler. And, and, of course, you know, the whole idea was Al does all his stuff. They have a good match. The Smoky Mountain TV audience has introduced Al Snow. Well, uh, first of all, Al had driven 10 hours that day and gotten up at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning to be there. So he was really tired. And, and then Al, at that point, wasn't doing, like, TV stuff. So your TV matches, you want them to be excited, fast-paced, and he basically went out with George and had like a house show match. And Jim told him, he's like, you know, I want you to do all your stuff. You're flipping and you're flopping. Then beat Al with your finish. Or beat uh, George with your finish. So they go out and they do the handshake spot for like five minutes, okay? Where he's trying to get George to shake his hand, you know, look to the crowd, all this stuff. It's going for like five minutes. It's boring as hell on TV. You know, great if you're there live. Boring on TV. Then they have like a minute of stuff and that's it. So then they come back and Jim's like, guys, that... that that wasn't really what I was looking for. So, George, I want you to go back out there, and this is reverse of how it normally happens, uh, but because George is the baby face, the good guy. I want you to go back out there. I want you to say, Al Snow, I bet you can't beat me twice in a row. 
And then Al comes out, and he just wanted to do uh, a couple minutes of stuff, of high spots, of Al doing his, as Jimmy would say, his flipping and his flying. And then Al small package drawers, and that's it. So, so they go back out to the ring. Now, I'd only been there a month, and I didn't know Cornette that well. And, like, they do maybe one high spot, okay? Maybe they're in the ring for, like, 30 seconds. And then Al does the small package. And... I got, I'll clean it up and I won't use all the, the language. But Jim is sitting there in front of the TV. He's like, what was that? What was that? What the blankety, blankety, blank? And he just, now, everybody else knew him. So I'm looking around and there, there's a, the, the monitor was a small black and white TV, right? But everybody else, like, gets up and, like, just walks out of the room. So it's me and Jim, right? And it goes from like he's talking loudly to he's yelling to he's screaming at the top of his lung every other word's an obscenity my dad was a sailor okay i ain't never heard nothing like this come out of his mouth i mean it was i was like oh my and finally he is just it's a crescendo of profanity coming out and then he starts throwing chairs right and i'm like what in what in the hell is going on here? And this goes on. I mean, just it goes on for like two minutes. And his face, I've never seen a human being's face do this. It wasn't red. It wasn't purple. It was this weird color that just like in, I mean, literally steam's coming out of his ears. His eyes are bulging. I thought his head was going to break open and like a demon was going to come flying out. And he's just going off and off and off. And then here come Al and George. And then he's, he turns around and he's like, you know, I mean, literally foaming at the mouth, like just and then he goes, guys, that wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I'll make it work. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, what kind of freak show have I got myself into here? So that was the best one. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us here this weekend and for being part of Mad Monster Party 2024 and for taking part in this Q&A. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Hey. But thank all of you for being here um, because, you know, without you all, again, I'm not sitting up here talking to you. Um, so on behalf of my family, thank you for everything that you've done for me. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys.